It's a pleasure to talk about uh, some people that I admire so much as the Roosevelts. The Roosevelts are some of our earliest colonizers into the New World. They were, came in the latter part of the 17th century to New York, of course, where all good Dutch people came. Roosevelt is definitely a Dutch term. I mean, it's a Dutch word. It means rosy field. Roosevelt, right? Uh, in fact, in South Africa, they call a, a meadow area a veld, right? So Roosevelt is uh, definitely a Dutch term. So they prospered in New York, and we're going to be talking about them as a clan, because the Roosevelts were, in fact, a large clan. Uh, I want to talk about just one other member of the clan, a guy named Robert Roosevelt, and um, he was a bit of a rake in New York, a very wealthy man. Uh, he had a, a, a thriving uh, law practice, and he also really liked the women of the demi monde, i.e., prostitutes. And he would uh, actually, uh, when he would have a girlfriend uh, like this, he'd always sew green uh, gloves uh, up to her elbow. Really, really nice gloves. And so uh, people, if you went around New York in certain areas, you'd see women wearing these green gloves. Uh, They're always made of certain leather and up to here. And so it was his way of kind of marking his territory, if you will. Uh, but uh, um, the Roosevelt family tended to be very moralistic, so they kind of looked at him a little bit down. But he was okay because he was so uh, involved in community uh, uh, affairs. And he had a great deal of wealth from his law practice. But he also precedes... Theodore Roosevelt, because he was very interested in preserving New York fisheries. He was the man of uh, preserving New York fisheries. And of course, even early on with them bringing in ships and dumping bilge, and of course, they were always uh, taking in the oyster beds, uh, you know, there was some real damage being done to the fisheries. And he was, early on in like the 1870s, you have Robert Roosevelt, who we, we don't even remember him, uh, doing some really important stuff, very un under the, you know, he's busy with his girlfriends and his law practice, and, but he's also very much interested in preserving New York waters, which are quite extensive if you know the layout of New York. You have all these different islands, and he really wanted to preserve uh, the marine wildlife because he liked to fish, so he wanted to keep him going there. So it kind of ran in the family, that interest in the natural environment. So this is Robert... Roosevelt, and I last saw his name when I was crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. I, I looked up and they had all the name of the principal donors. There it is, Robert uh, B. Uh, Barnwell uh, Roosevelt. And uh, so he was in, also involved in the production of the Brooklyn Bridge, which was, I think, in the 1870s, maybe early 1880s. This isn't a lecture about them. So, um, and actually, Theodore Roosevelt thought for a little while that he was going to be a lawyer, and he uh, practiced law with Robert Roosevelt for just a little while, and then he just decided he was going to get right into uh, the practice of politics. Now, the time that he lives in is a very important time. It's after the Civil War. And after the Civil War, if you follow it, be before the Civil War, who dominated America? The South. The South were very wealthy. Uh, they had a lock. Uh, first of all, the capital was in the South. Washington, D.C., which was a real plus for them before the uh, Civil War, and it became a very ne a great negative to them during the war because the, the, the forwardmost place of the North was right in the middle of Virginia, right? So what had been a good thing at one time was a bad thing later. Anyway, the South had a lot of control before the Civil War. The Civil War happened, and uh, Sam Houston's predictions were uh, correct. He said, you people in the South are, have a very passionate nature, and he said, you're going to war against the North, and you may win, but I doubt it. He says, the North move with an inexorable force, like a glacier. He says, once they get fired up, they don't stop until they get it done. He says, you're going to expend you know, th uh, tens of thousands of people dead. He was wrong by an order of magnitude there. And a, a lot of treasure, and you're not going to win. What did the Texans do? They threw him out of office and went to war. And, but his predictions uh, came true. So the South um, had a lock on a, a, um, a lot of the key committees because they were uh, nominated for long periods of time. The South 
was the dominant part of the Union, although a lot of stuff was going up in the north. There's train building going on up there, but we had this, this powerful aristocracy that ha wanted to expand into the Caribbean. They had this whole idea of this dusky slave empire. Now, it's important that I talk about it to just give the, the, the setup. And we know, of course, with the Civil War, that the South, with all of its dreams of grandeur in northern South America and the Caribbean and along the Mexican coast, they fail. So they're in smoldering in ruins in the South, uh, Grant's march to the sea. Um, and Lincoln was not aware of what, what he was doing in Wall Street, in terms of Wall Street. He just wanted money to buy, uh, to get equipment to win the war. He, he did, wasn't aware that he was creating a, a virtual Frankenstein by pumping out, making money and stuff, and shifting uh, all this power into the North. But they managed to uh, set a course for putting a railroad across the, the nation, for dividing up the land. They really did, uh, the North, once they were freed of the South during the Civil War, they put through a number of landmark legislations that would stand them in good stead after the war. So what we get is a major shift from the South to the North, and then with the, North, with the South being in shambles, we have the North just taking off and going across the country. And furthermore, with all this excellent equipment and an army that's extraordinarily well-trained, we have uh, Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, go from being the lead general, uh, you know, crushing the South, to being the lead Indian person. So now let, let's turn our attentions to Roosevelt. Lincoln gets shot and, he, and, his, uh, and is murdered by John Wilkes Booth. On his way back to Springfield, Illinois, uh, his body goes to New York. And there's actually a shot of Roosevelt when he's six years old, looking out the window of his parents' very nice house, um, looking at the uh, cortege going by. So now we have um, Roosevelt coming in at a very early age from a very wealthy household. He was Roosevelt. And he's watching uh, Lincoln's funeral cortege. And all of his life, he was a great admirer of Lincoln and, and wanted to be like Lincoln. He really wanted to be a war president, and that was always uh, forbidden to him. So at the age of six, we see him hanging out the window, looking at uh, Abraham Lincoln's body uh, going by. Him personally, he, had a very, he was a weakling as a young person. He had asthma. And he was always uh, having trouble with his body. He, he was a very smart kid, was, would probably have been put on Ritalin in our own time because he was always like you know, running around and thinking really all these thoughts, interrupting people. And uh, he was one of these kind of kids. Uh, kids. Um, and his father came to him one day and he really respected his father, who he called Great Heart. And his father said, son, you have the mind, but you don't have the body. He said, you have to make your body. And his father said it, it, was, it really you know, like came to him. He goes, okay. And he started doing Indian bells and all the different or Indian clubs and all the various ways of making your body strong back then. He did it. He was lifting weights. And he really made his body very, very strong in about a five-year period of time. He went to Germany, learned German, went on a, a prolonged, leisurely upper-class trip to the Holy Land, went up uh, the uh, Nile River, shooting birds all the while, stuffing birds. He was always into animals and also really, we have to state it up front, killing animals. He loved to kill animals. He had heads all over his house. His wife just got tired of his, all of his buffalo heads hanging every which way. But so he was raised in this post-war period where the North is dominant and we have what he will later call malefactors of great wealth coming into power. What are they coming into power doing? Making railroads, making, getting into steel. This is the era of J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan made his early fortune in the Civil War by uh, various uh, ways selling weaponry, and he made his fortune. So who's J.P. Morgan? He's one of the great finan uh, financial people on Wall Street. Who else? Carnegie is making steel for rails. They're making infrastructure. And so this is the first major... Um, source of uh, wealth in America is them pushing through that railroad, uh, the Union Pacific Railroad. And we look at the date of it. What is the date that they drive the stake at Promontory Point? Anyone? Yes. 1869. 1869. Four years after the Civil War, they drive the stake. That's, that's, like, that's like boom. They're on it. And they're like holding out bottles of champagne and beer. Yeah, we did it. And they're killing Indians all the way across. And so during this time, 
uh, the Wall Street is having it all its own way. They're, they're making money. It's, the, um, it's a certain a part of capitalism where the capitalists can do whatever they want. They don't have to pay people any, anything. They only have to pay them enough to get them to come in the door. They don't, they don't have to protect them. They don't have to do anything, really. And so if someone gets their arm ripped off or they get burned to death, there's no money. They just throw them out or get, get rid of them. Get them out of here, you know. So there was no protections. This is a time period in capitalism which was the rawest form of capitalism where they just didn't care. Like to be a brakeman on uh, one of the railroads was to be courting death because they didn't have uh, connection. They didn't have, you had to go from car to car and, and turn brakes on all of them running on uh, the top of a train that's covered with ice. Well, you know what? A good third of you are going to fall off and get your art leg cut off. And so if you look at the magazines for the railroads at the time, half of the, uh, the um, ads are for uh, prosthe prostheses, right? And it just shows what was going on with the railroads. If you were on a railroad, you're going to probably get a prosthesis at some point from getting run over. So it was a time, uh, it, it was an exhilarating time. Wow, we're building a railroad across. We're, oh yeah, we're killing those damn Indians. Hey, get those bastards out of the way. I don't think that there, there was any love lost except for among a very few sensitive souls that really cared about the Indians. No one, can we say it, gave a damn about the Indians, the Redskins, the wild men. They just killed them. And we treated them particularly badly. The Canadians uh, had their way with them and they were much more gentle. Uh, but America, there's no way, shape or form we were gentle with the Indians. We put them off on bad reservations and let them die or not feed them very well because we had corrupt sutlers feeding them. Sutlers is a person who, who is supposed to bring in food for the Indians. So we're, we're going across the country. It's a really a quick way to, to develop a country, isn't it? They, how soon does it take? from 1965 to the frontier closes in what, uh, 1893 or something like that, maybe a little right around there, 30 years. I, I mean, I've been alive for 60 years. That's like half of my life. They, they completely they go from Mississippi all the way to, to California, which of course had already been uh, fairly well developed in the San Francisco Monterey area because of the gold that was inland along Highway 49, just on the other side there. So this is the whole time zone that he is uh, being raised, and he's in a very wealthy family. But his family also, like Robert uh, and his father, they were, they had a very strong moral sense. His father would take care of people, of little kids that were selling newspapers. That was his big thing. He would go down and, and make sure they were warm and had food and stuff like that. He said, his father says, I have a very uh, nasty, guilty conscience. And so uh, Theodore Roosevelt got a bit of his conscience from his clan, and from his father. He, he cared. He, he, was, he was told, you need to care about people. You need to take some responsibility. And uh, later on, he phrased it like this. He said, um, I don't want to just be a wealthy person. He says, I want to control. I want to be in the positions of control. Because during this period of time, government was looked at as a distinctly secondary, even tertiary level of employment. Um, for example, Vanderbilt, the famous, first he developed uh, boats, steamships along the East Coast, then he bought into the railroads. The, the great Grand Central Station was built by Vanderbilt. Uh, uh, if you were a congressman, you had to come in through the servant's entrance, right? You were not allowed to come in through the front door. You were a servant. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we have a congressman coming in? Okay, come in here. This is what I want you to do. You vote this way, and I'll bank. Not, now get out. You know, th this was how you dealt with congressmen. You didn't, they were dirt. They were the people you used. Um, and uh, uh, and that, that's, that's a true story about the Vanderbilts. They just, you know, they, 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 he, here's what Vanderbilt himself said in 1872, I think, uh, just before he died. He says, well, I got the money. I can do it, can't I? And so if you have the money, you can do it, right? That was the idea. Well, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, grows up, he goes to Harvard. He's not that pleasant of a person, actually, earlier on. Uh, one time he gets in a bad argument with this woman who will become his wife, and he's coming home and he's cursing, he's armed, and uh, a dog barks at him and he shoots the dog. So he's not an altogether pleasant person. And then he, he, he has his eyes on this woman that he will marry, but the marriage won't last very long. Uh, her name is, uh, is Anne, and... Um, he, he's after her, and he, buy, he deliberately goes out and lets it be known that he's bought dueling pistols. And so that means that if someone else wants Anne, 
they're going to have to come over him and his dueling pistols to get at her. And everyone knows that Theodore Roosevelt has a, uh, stands by his word. He's going he's to shoot you, you know, if, if you come after Anne. So um, he attends Harvard. His father dies of stomach cancer in his, I believe, second year at Harvard. And he comes into his fortune at that time. Um, so he finishes Harvard, and he goes right into the state legislature in New York, which was like the center of the universe at the time. New York, I repeat, was the center of the universe at the time. It's called the Empire State. Yes, it was the Empire State, because all the money was there. The capital, a lot of the, uh, where the, the happening place was there. That's where the Erie, Erie Canal came in there. And it was close to the Pennsylvania coal work, so Pittsburgh is starting to grow. It's all happening right back there on the East Coast, right around in Roosevelt land. And so, uh, but he's wealthy. He's not really worried about this. He wants to get into a position of political power. And everyone else is talking to him, why do you want to get into political power? He goes, because I want to uh, be powerful. I want to control the destiny of this country. I want to do that. And he starts very early, he starts talking about malefactors of great wealth. Do we have malefactors of great wealth now? Yeah, I think if we look around under a few old uh, carpets, we might kick out a few. Yeah, malefactors of great wealth is a term he came up with. He says, we need to take the power away from them. They, they shouldn't have power. And that was his driving, uh, uh, his, uh, how, what he wanted to do. Anyway, he and his dueling pistols, he married and... Uh, I forget her name, last, I think her last name was Lee, and um, married her and was madly in love with her for a couple of years. Uh, she got pregnant, delivered a child, uh, with, um, and her name was Alice. Alice, uh, would be, ultimately her last name would be Longworth, and her, 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 his wife, Anne, dies of Bright's disease, which is a uh, disease of childbirth. It's a childbed disease. Uh, when women deliver children, of course, they're very exposed in that area, and often they are subject to kidney uh, problems. And she died of, of kidney ailment. Uh, she just backed up, couldn't clean it, and died. And what happened in the same house on the same day is his mother died in New York. So he's coming back from Albany on a slow-moving train. Trains didn't go over 30 miles an hour at that time. Everything is slow, okay? Never think that things are fast. Things are slow at this time. St Mississippi steamboats go like 15, 20 miles an hour upstream. Everything, so he comes back, and he arrives to find his wife in a delirium and his mother dying upstairs. And it just hit him like a ton of bricks. You can only imagine. His brother met him at the door saying, this house is cursed. And, and it, just, it just took the wind out of his sails. It actually made him a deeper person, too, because he, both the Roosevelt's, as we will see, suffered greatly in their lives in, in, in very different ways, but they suffered very deep, uh, deeply. So what did he do to get over his uh, depression? Is he went out west and he wanted to become a cattle baron. And he had his family money, so he went out there and became a cattle baron out in what we call the Badlands. This is really ugly looking. It's not, it's really fascinating terrain. It's called the Badlands for a reason though. It's kind of weird looking, uh, a lot of hoodoos and stuff. Um, and he ran cattle out there for a while. And he said it made him as a politician because he learned how to deal with normal men. But you have to get the idea of this guy dressed in buckskin with his uh, Winchester that, that's been engraved by Tiffany. You know, so he's quite the guy out there on his house, on his, on his horse. And one of the famous phrases is he, is he says, hasten thee forward there. Do a bunch of cow pokes out there. Hasten forward there. And they're going, who are you? You know, but he was tough. He was, he was a boxer uh, at Harvard. And he goes, he went into a, a bar and he had his glasses on because he was very, uh, he, he, I think he was very myopic. And um, he had his glasses on, and some guy was at the bar drunk, says, oh, look at four eyes here. Four eyes, you're going to buy me a drink. He, and and he's, he, doesn't, he didn't take, as the phrase goes, he didn't take any shit from people. And he goes, uh, no, I'm not. And he goes, yes, you are. And then uh, 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 Theodore Roosevelt just knocked him out. <laughs> just knocked him flat on the floor, because he was a boxer. 
And, and everyone said, yeah, he deserved it. And so he was a friend to all, everyone in the saloon, and his reputation started to grow then. So his reputation is starting out there in the West. So he runs herds, and he's out there. He loves it. He, he just loves suffering, actually. He's been told a couple of times in his life that he's going to die young. He goes, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to have a really good time doing it. He says, he, does, he says, you need to go home and go to sleep and take real good care of yourself. He says, no, I'm not. I'm going to live like I'm, he says, I'm just going to live my life until I, I die. And he lived, as he himself said, a life that, uh, that eight people, it would take eight people to live. And he's pretty accurate about that. I mean, he was always moving. He read 20,000 books, had all these languages, wrote several, he wrote 20 books. You know, I mean, the guy was all over the place uh, being busy. So he invested in a herd, but he invested at a very bad time. Do, what, what happened? What was that weather system that just came down uh, last week from Canada? We had a cyclone or some horrific North Pole event that just froze everything. And yeah, is a polar vortex. Well, they had a, a polar vortex type thing just after he bought his herd. And it, it killed his herd. And so all the, all the animals were dead. And they kind of died close to water because you know, they needed water. They said that when it melted that year, it was like a wall of dead uh, of, uh, cattle carcasses just coming down the water flow. They said it was like one of the ugliest things they've ever seen because everyone lost their herds in the Dakotas at that time. It wasn't North and South at that time. It was just called the Dakotas. But by this time, his energies were shifting. You have to realize that you could go back east pretty easily by train. You know, it was 30 miles an hour, but you just sleep, uh, you know, in a, in a Pullman, and you got back to New York pretty quick. Um, so he goes back and run in, run in, runs into his girl, uh, his childhood girlfriend named Edith. Now, remember, his wife died of Bright's disease, uh, but he had... His, his kind of early intended was a woman named Edith. And he runs into her. They've been avoiding each other because, you know, this is the Victorian period. I can only marry once. And, other, and from then on, I just have to think romantic thoughts about my dead wife, right? That's, that's how you were supposed to do it, apparently, at that time. But he runs into her. And the flame is rekindled. Uh, and they marry in a small ceremony in London. And then he comes back, and he gets back into politics. But... His fortune has been wrecked by his investment in cattle. And so I'm going to go kind of quickly through how he goes up, moves up the chain in terms of his pol political environment. He does a couple of interesting things. One, he's a police commissioner in, in, in um, New York. And, he, and he's up all night going around to see if, if the police are, are sleeping. And they, you know, the police are sleeping in whorehouses and drinking and doing all this stuff. And, and he's up there walking around every night. Where are you? Oh, uh, he's upstairs with, uh, uh, you know, Mad Peg, huh? Let's go see where he is. And he'd go up into the whorehouse and rouse the, the cop out of the room. So he was doing his job. And by the way, the, the, the New York politicos did not like him doing that. But he's, he's trying to clean up the police force. He was on the commission. And so early on, he gets this uh, strong reputation for uh, great... Uh, not humility, but uh, 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 very honest. He's a very honest person, and he likes things done the right way. Later on, he goes to Washington and makes a lot of connections up there. And you have to recall that he and his wife are moving in these most elevated circles you could move into at the time. Circles that we will never even see the, the trash cans of, right? Even now. I mean, these are people that are living in another universe. You know, there are other economic universes that we will never see. They had them back then, too, and he lived in it. So he was, uh, uh, you know, eating lunch with Henry Adams, if you know anything about Henry Adams, and with the wealthy people. He was, he was moving at that level. So uh, one of the things he did, he was on the uh, commission to uh, straighten up the uh, spoils system and move it over to a meritocracy where you had to test to get a position in the federal government. Uh, if you recall before that, uh, Lincoln actually used it to great effect. You, uh, uh, you, it was called the spoils system. You just give jobs to your best friends. They might not know anything at all about what the job you gave them, but they got the money for it. That's called the spoils system. And uh, what they, they moved over to was this other system that was merit-based. So you couldn't just clear everyone out, throw everyone out, and uh, move in a, a bunch of, of your own friends into this developing bureaucracy called the federal government. Do you see how that would work? 
you know, it would be a movement forward, wouldn't it? It would be a progress. So uh, he's involved in these progressive moves, you know, uh, dealing with the police force in New York, dealing with the uh, commission for um, the bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. Well, he gets his main chance, and this is when he really takes off like a rocket, when he becomes uh, the deputy or the assistant secretary of the Navy. Now, that means nothing to us anymore because we're not relying on the Navy anymore. What do we have? We have some destroyers that are armed with nukes and with Tomahawk missiles. We have uh, submarines that do have nukes, and we have aircraft carriers, which are mainly used for what? Aircraft, right? Well, this was the time when they had these big battleships, and so that's how you control the high seas. The British had the most, and, but uh, uh, we had a few, and, and he was very much interested. One of his earliest books was written about the, uh, the Navy, the Naval War on, the Erie, on Lake Erie. So he got his position there, and something came up that was really big. A big thing came up, and this is the era of the yellow, yellow press. The main, one of our big battleships, is parked in Cuba, and it blows up. National Geographic has since gone back and done a magisterial uh, look at the situation, and they have determined that it was bad coal badly put in to their coal storage area. You know, the Spanish did not have any torpedoes, any floating bombs, and, but that's what they said in the newspapers at the time. And that's what, so it was, it was full on. The Spanish blow up the, the main. It was a lie. Has that stopped us uh, very much from going to war? Lies? Let's see. Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Um, let's see. Uh, what had, uh, weapons of mass destruction. Where were they? They just didn't know, they didn't say open sesame, or these doors would have opened and they would have been able to find them. Mexico. Pardon me? Mexican war. The Mexican War. I forget what devious things they must have been doing. But the point is, is that the big lie, everyone gets into it. Yeah, those damn Spanish, we need to go get them. And so what uh, at this, uh, his boss was the Secretary of Naval Affairs, was an elderly gentleman who was always off taking the waters in Saratoga or whatever. So he was often gone. And who would take his place? Roosevelt. Roosevelt ordered Admiral Dewey to coal up his... Um, uh, fleet and be ready to attack the Philippines. And, uh, and he was the one that actually sent the uh, uh, telegram for, for, for to start moving ahead. So in a sense, he who wanted a war uh, 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 more than anything else started the Spanish-American War, which as they uh, as he called it, was a splendid little war. Didn't last very long. We kicked their ass really quickly and we were through with it. Um, Tolstoy has a really good way of describing the Spanish-American War. He said, think of a very powerful young pugilist in his 20s, at the height of his powers, and then think that he is in the uh, ring with an 89-year-old gentleman, uh, a very high, uh, very digni dignified with a, a sense of honor, and the young man keeps like hitting him, saying, you wanna fight? You're gonna fight, aren't you? We're gonna fight. And the guy is dignified, and he just can't take this, hits on his honor and says, yes, I will fight. And so the pugilist says, just, and, and, and he does a high arc out of, the, out of the ring. That's what Tolstoy said the Spanish-American War was. So was it legitimate? The main was not sunk by, uh, by the perfidious Spanish, and the Americans forced it. So, but it made him a hero. What did he do? He quit his job, and even though his wife was sick nearly unto death, he formed a very famous militia group, I guess you'd call them, uh, called the Rough Riders. And he enters American history in a big way. Who are the Rough Riders? They're polo players from Harvard. They're Indians. They're people from the Dakotas that he rode a horse with. There's this motley crew. And by now, he's very well aware of the power of the press. So he has one of the, mo the, the finest press men along with him as he goes to Cuba. And he makes it so that his boat is the first that lands on Cuba. He pulls all of his strings in order so he can be first to attack in Cuba. So he's right there, and he lands, and he, he has what he calls his crowded hour, charging up San Juan Hill. Uh, it's not San Juan Hill, it's Kettle Hill. Who cares? But anyway, he's already, he uh, charges up the hill. 
the Spanish have really good guns. They have German Mausers, and they, a lot of people uh, get killed. But he doesn't get killed, although you know he nearly gets killed. He kills a number of people with his pistol, and he is the hero of the hour. And he comes home and he writes a book called, could be called, "I Am the Hero of the Hour," you know, and it and it sells. And all of a sudden, this guy who had been the assistant secretary of the navy and just some guy who was into the you know various commissions and just kind of a background guy, although he was known. Uh, becomes a hero, a national hero. He's uh, the, the main name. When you think Spanish-American War, you think of Admiral Dewey, or Commodore Dewey, I think, and you think of Roosevelt. He comes back, and in New York, they're having a hell of a, of a, of a problem with, um, with corruption. And so they reluctantly run him for governor, and he wins. They would never have run him for governor. But they, 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 they had been caught with their pants way down and their hands way in the till. And they said, we want to keep power. Let's run Roosevelt. And he won. Well, he immediately starts doing what? Reform. He starts reforming things. He doesn't do what Boss Platt tells him to do. So who's president around this time? It's a fellow who had fought at Antietam, a very dignified gentleman who did not want to uh, roil the waters at all. His you know, president was a person who sits in a chair and does what the big guys tell him to do. The guy named William McKinney, McKinley, after who the uh, mountain in Alaska was named for a while at least. Um, so the people in New York, which is a very powerful state, get so tired of this guy who's trying to reform them that they, quote, kick him upstairs. They have him run as vice president with McKinley. Now, vice president is not a very valuable position. Uh, Jake Garner called it uh, a worth about a bucket of warm spit, except spit's not the word. A bucket of warm piss is what he said. Uh, it's not a very valuable position. It doesn't have any power. Well, uh, a, a, another person said, and he said, you idiots, Why are you, you're putting him right next to the presidency. All you need is one bullet, and he's going to be president. And they just laughed him off. Oh, shut up. Anyway, he ran for president, went all over the country running for, uh, for McKinley, who just sat on his front porch, which was the typical way you ran for president at the time. You sat on your front porch and had all the, peop you know, the people from newspapers come up and ask you questions, and you'd answer them if you wanted to, or you'd go inside and have tea. Interesting detail about uh, uh, McKinley that I, can't, I can never pass by. His wife had a terrible uh, nervous condition on her face, and, 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 and she would go these, her face would twist terribly, like, I can't make my face do it automatically. I mean, she had this terrible twitch on her face. And, and she would do it at parties uh, in the White House. All of a sudden, she'd, her face would spaz out. And, and he'd look at her doing it, and he'd just put out a, a handkerchief and just put it over her face and then return to talk. It was a very polite thing to do, you know, and why it's over there, you know. Um, Anyway, so Teddy Roosevelt, Mr. Energy himself, goes all over the country running for McKinley, and McKinley wins. Great. McKinley's in, and now Teddy Roosevelt gets to look forward to, what, four years of being vice president? Oh, boy. Well, you don't uh, stand in the way of a man of destiny, and he is a man of destiny. So about six months uh, later, um, I forget when they, were, uh, when they inaugurated, they may have shifted it to January like it is now. It may have been later, like April. Uh, it was still March. It was still March, yeah. So um, we have McKinley going to Buffalo to one of these great uh, expositions that were so popular, all the way up through, um, like, Seattle uh, had a big, uh, you know, these world fairs. Uh, they were real big in the time, at the time. It, and it was a, 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 it's like having the Olympics now. You know, it's, a, it's a, a reason for a town to gussy itself up, spend some money, and have a bunch of people come in, right? So Buffalo was doing that. And McKinley went there and was, as the phrase goes, was shot by an anarchist. And so it was a gut shot, boom, right? In his, in his big old uh, gut, like mine here. And so he, he got shot in his gut. And, uh, and gut shots are very difficult to predict. Um, you don't know how they're going to work out. There's no antibiotics. Uh, and uh, Anyway, he was shot. I think they even got the bullet out. And he was looking good. And so he goes up to the mountains uh, to go on a hike with his family. And he's up there. He come, he, they hike a mountain. And then he's coming down. And he sees a really tired uh, messenger getting off his horse and walking up to the place where he and his family 
are staying. And he goes, holy smoke, because he knows what it means. They wouldn't send a, a, a guy, you know, 30 miles into the backcountry by mule for no reason at all. He realizes that McKinley is either dead or dying. And he was in the process of that. He was dead, I think, by that time. So they hitch up the horses, and it's a madcap scheme. They have a, a buckboard with four mighty horses, and they just haul down this dirt road all the way to the train, take the train to Buffalo, and by that time, uh, McKinley is dead, and the whole town is draped in black crepe. So what has happened? A person who would never have gotten close to the presidency is president, and he's going to make it his own. And he proceeds to do so. And, and the newspapers love him because he's always, he has like six kids, and he has Alice and five kids by Edith. And they have ponies in the White House. It's, it's like a walking circus. And, and so the newspapers love it because there's always something going on. They're, they're, they're always doing something, uh, playing around. Uh, doing, and, and he's the biggest kid of them all. He'll get up on top of his desk and gesture and stuff. My favorite description is, is he would have a, 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 an informal discussion with reporters in the morning while he's being shaved, which is kind of a delicate thing to do, right? And they said he would use dental percussion. He goes, yes, we did it. And, uh, and, and they put comment, dental percussion. And, and I'm trying to figure that out. And so, and the guy's trying to shape him, you know, and this guy's, he's making all this noise and, and then he'd get up and almost get his throat cut and then he'd sit back down, dental percussion, you know, and then he'd uh, go on. So we have this, this live wire of a president who is yet very intelligent, written all these books and he's very much into nature. And so all his values are going to come up and things are going to change mightily in the course of his seven years plus as president, right? I mean, he comes in, what, six months or five months or whatever it is after the election, after the inauguration. He could have possibly stayed in for yet another term, but, well, we'll get to that later. He says, when he wins his second term, he says, I will not run again, which was the stupidest thing he could have done. He, he see himself said that. He said, I should never have said that. So he was only in for seven years. He would leave it to his uh, uh, nephew or his uh, cousin, his distant cousin, FDR, to uh, push the limits on, on how long a president can stay in office. So he's in office. What are some of the things he does? You, you know some of them. He starts the national park system. He looks at the Grand Canyon where they want to drill and you know, make mines and stuff. He says, nature has made it. Humans can't improve it. We're putting it aside. Said the same thing about Yosemite. He just went around making, uh, starting the national park system. And with a fellow named Gifford Pinchot, he starts the uh, national forest system, which is a secondary thing. So he's very much interested in the natural world and saving the, uh, and, and making a park system. And you'll notice that there's very few park systems on the East Coast. And there's a very good reason for that, because it was all bought. You know, uh, obviously Niagara Falls would have been a national park. But it had already been, all, you know, been purchased. Uh, you know, all the main uh, places were bought. So everything was privatized on the East Coast. You go to any of the national parks on the East Coast, and they're dinky. Like Acadia, I mean, that, was, that belonged to the Roosevelts. It was just some carriage trails uh, up uh, in Maine. I mean, there's nothing to it. it. But it's when you get out west with all that space. That's where you start getting to some really major national parks. And then it's up in Alaska where you get the big mamas like uh, Mount St. Elias and those. I mean, you may not have gone up to Alaska, uh, but you need planes to get out to those ones. And they're, they're just huge, like million acre places. So he starts that. That's an impressive thing. How many of you like the national park system? Yeah, pretty cool, you know? I mean, yeah, and the rangers, the rangers were, were uh, that was a whole development. How to, what, what makes a ranger? That was uh, Gifford Pinchot, who was a very good friend uh, with uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Okay, a story. Gifford Pinchot first meets Roosevelt when he's governor in New York and he's putting aside land in New York. And the first thing that Theodore Roosevelt does with Gifford Pinchot, he says, oh, so you're a Harvard man, do you wrestle? And he goes, well, yes, I wrestle, and I even box. He goes, well, let's wrestle. And so uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt takes off his clothes and, and, and he wrestles with Pinchot, right? Pinchot's this real tall guy and, and of course, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's real stocky. And he wrestles him to the ground and pins him. Okay, so he went up, and then he goes, now let's box. 
and and that and Gilbert Pinchot had a lot better range, so he clock he knocked him out. <laughs> he knocked Theodore Roosevelt out in his own office, punching him. So this is the kind of guy Theodore Roosevelt is. And you know, of course, the newspapers get a hold of that and they just love it. You know, governor wrestling with Gifford Pinchot, who's another millionaire uh, from a very wealthy family. So just a, a, a wonderful character. You, you can't read his biographies without, I don't know, either hating him or loving him. I think he's, he's a fascinating person. So what else did he do? He, uh, right around this time, a book came out called The Jungle and it talks about the terrible practices in Chicago in the meatpacking industry. I think in one case, some woman delivers a child and they, they chop up the baby and make it into meat. I mean, put it in a, in a can it, you know. I mean, it was a melodramatic thing, right? They made books like that. And, and so it was awful. The terrible things they're doing to, in these meatpacking uh, places in Chicago. So what does he do? He starts the DEA, the department, uh, no, not the DEA, um, the... Um, FDA, thank you, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Why? To have inspectors going around to make sure they're not like putting crap in, your, in these cans that they're selling to you. You know, if, if you look at anything, if I pick up this uh, Frappuccino over here, it has a list of everything that's in there. And there's going to be an inspector coming around every two years, and he's going to randomly take one of those things and test it. That's pretty good. We know what we're getting. Before that, they could pee in it and hand it out to you, and they would, no one would know the better. No, I, I, it's really true. So, and, then, and then the drug situation, the only drug there was was, was uh, morphine. And they, the, basically any drug you got was some variation on a theme in morphine up until like 1890s when they first developed, uh, uh, Bayer first put out aspirin. So obviously these, uh, these industries, the food and drug areas needed, yeah, see you later, uh, needed control. What else did he do? He won the Nobel Prize for officiating over the end of the Russo-Japanese War. What else did he do? He was a trust buster. He broke up these monopolies that were controlling the economic activities of our country. He was also very much into building our navy. The great white navy was, uh, by and large, his idea. So he's a president of the 20th century, and he was president for like that first seven years, and he was everywhere. He was, uh, and, and perhaps the most important thing that he did, because he's looking in the future and he's seeing that we we're going to be a two ocean navy, is he took over Panama. And he just took it over. He, he arranged them to overthrow the government there. It was owned by Colombia. He set up an overthrow, overthrew it, and then built uh, the Panama Canal, which belonged to us all the way through the Carter administration. So is that a kind of a nice thing to own? Very nice. Why would he want it for the Navy? Because otherwise you have to go all the way around South America to get your Navy over to uh, the Pacific. So these are the things that he was known for, right, in his presidency for doing. Panama Canal, Food and Drug Administra uh, 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 Administration, National Park System. You know, a number of very important things were done. Uh, and you can look at him as the last of the reform Republicans. You can look high and low politically after this gentleman, and you will not find a, re a reform Republican, a Republican who's saying, oh, you little guy, what can we do to help you? What are Republicans for? They're for what they were from the Civil War all the way up to his presidency. They're for the party of the money. Do I need to repeat that? They are the party of the money. And... He, and what did he say again? I am here to, because the only agency that can control malefactors of great wealth is the federal government. And I am here to use the federal government to do that. So he starts it up. He dies relatively young. Um, he ran again for president, was shot, nearly assassinated. Um, but he, he continued and gave an hour and a half speech after being shot. Um, and he was nearly killed. It was right over his heart. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. And then he was also nearly killed when he went down to South America and went down the River of Doubt. It was, and it was called the River of Doubt because no one knows where uh, it went out. So they did something like uh, 50 portages. They're using these huge dugout canoes, and they're going down this river with all these steep falls. So they're having to drag them around. Uh, uh, there was a murder on it. He nearly died. 
fact, he begged him to leave, leave him. He said, just leave me here, I'll die. He was incoherent for most of the, of the trip down. He made it. He was with his son, and he knew that they would send a big expedition out to get his body. And he, just did, he said, I'm gonna, you know, we're going to get him out. And they did. He always brought with him, uh, by the way, he always brought a, a kit with him that was always on his person. That um, He says, to preserve me from a sordid death, I always keep morphine and uh, a, a syringe and two large vials in order to kill myself if I'm caught out in the middle of the jungle and I need to off myself. That, that he did that. Well, he didn't do that. I mean, he managed to get around doing that. Um, so he came back. He kind of staggered back from that adventure. He was never quite the same after that. I think he, get, he got malaria in, in Cuba during the Spanish-American War, and I really think he got some nasty uh, jungle uh, virus uh, during going down the River of Doubt, which is now called the Rio Teodoro after him. Theodore, right? So... Um, he dies directly after World War II. If he would have taken better care of himself, he probably would have run for president in 1920. But instead, Warren Harding uh, won because Theodore died. So he lived to be 60. And he had a very uh, unique life packed with incident. I haven't even talked about most of the, all the things he's done, all the books he's written all the speeches he gave, all the, how busy he was. Just uh, uh, an incredible person. Always was running to wherever he was going. And he had uh, a total of six kids. Okay, one of the things that happened when he was in the White House was he married Franklin Delano Roosevelt to his uh, niece, Eleanor Roosevelt. It's good to keep the name in the family, he said. So uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was the daughter of his brother who was a, bat, a black sheep. He was taking way too much morphine and drinking and, and he ultimately jumped out of a window and killed himself and that was the best thing that happened to him. And, but anyway, the, the, uh, the, his daughter was kept and, and, uh, and it was uh, Theodore's favorite niece. So that happened in the White House. FDR is married to uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. And let me just uh, show you a picture, uh, just briefly. I, I, I hope I'm not running too far over time. What, what are we going to here? Uh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll try to speed it up a little bit. Okay, so here we... Nah. Um, here is Eleanor Roosevelt, later on in her life, uh, in the offices of Knopf, the, the publisher, she was a power in her own right. She was from the tribe, and she, she was the, one of the key founders of the UN. Uh, she was a woman to be reckoned with. And uh, one of the things you had going on during the Clinton administration is that they were worried that Hillary Clinton would become like Eleanor, would become a political force in her own right. No, you had, it, was, it, it was often brought up. We don't want another, Hillary, or another Eleanor here because Hillary had her own ideas, right? And wanted to be a in a position of power. Anyway, that's Eleanor. And I'm gonna put this here. We're gonna be looking at this guy. Let me zoom it, and then I'll talk about it. So this is FDR. FDR is from the other part of the family. There's, uh, for, um, for the sake of ease, we can look at two, there's two branches of the Roosevelt family. There's the, the branch that's out on Long Island, the Sagamore Hill Roosevelt's, and then there's the one up the Hudson River, the Hudson River Roosevelt's, and that's where he's from. You can visit his house, he's buried on his estate right next to Eleanor, uh, and you go up the Eleanor, uh, the Hudson River. We have no concept on the West Coast of what, what the Hudson River means. It means a place with a bunch of castles and wealthy people li living there. I mean, I don't know how it is now, but when I drove uh, many years ago, it's just it's a beautiful drive, and wealthy people live there. It's D Dutchess County. So, very early in his life, um, he was a spoiled chap. He was the only uh, son of an overbearing mother, and uh, his father made his money in the China trade, which was selling opium to the Chinese. Um, and they had their nice little estate on the Hudson River. So he had a very carefree youth with his own horse, the whole bit, and private tutors, 
trips to Europe every year. He was to the manor born, born with a gold spoon in his mouth, as they like to say, or a silver spoon, whatever. He's wearing, by the way, his famous, uh, his favorite cape. It's a naval cape because he, too, became uh, a secretary of the Navy or assistant secretary of the Navy. Uh, what he did is very unusual. It's, it's almost a form of magic was he uh, imitated Theodore Roosevelt down to the finest detail. He wore pince nez. Now, Theodore didn't smoke, and that was one thing that set him apart. He always had this, he, he smoked camels in an ivory um, cigarette holder. Now, of course, at that time, smoking was, everyone did it. Dogs did it, cats did it, humans did it. Everyone smoked, so you, you can't, you, you just don't judge him on, on smoking. Everyone did it. Uh, so uh, he deliber- set out to deliberately imitate Theodore Roosevelt. He wore pince nez. Uh, uh, as a pinch nose, it's a form of glasses that are not held by your ears, right? They're just held on your nose, like this. They work pretty well, actually. I have a, a pince nez that I use at home. Um, so a pince nez, why? Because Theodore had one. And he had six kids by Eleanor. Why? Because Theodore had six kids. So he was imitating him just to, down to detail. And he got into the New York legislature, just like Theodore did, was, uh, got to be uh, uh, assistant secretary of the Navy, just like Theodore did. And uh, their suffering is where they, uh, they go their separate ways. His great suffering happened, oddly, uh, when he turned 39. He was on a really good kind of a rocket ship to power. Very arrogant person, very athletic. And he got polio. By the way, it's the reason why we have uh, um, FDR on the dime. If you recall, you probably don't recall, there used to be this thing called March of Dimes. And, uh, be, and so it all harmonized. They, they changed the dime to fit because you had the March of Dimes and you wanted him to be on the dime because he had polio, right? So it all went together. It was, it was a whole thing that went on when people were fighting polio. That's back in the 50s. They ultimately overcame it. What was he responsible for? I'll, con- uh, I'll just confine myself to the, what, uh, what has come down to us that are, is very important to us as citizens in our country. He regulated a lot of stuff, and a lot of the regulations that they pulled back have come around to bite us really hard. Like the whole reason we had that housing crisis was because regulations that his people put in were, were taken off, right? So he's back in the, uh, the, what happens is in 1929, at the beginning of Herbert Hoover's Uh, presidency is the beginning of the Great Depression. It's a suffering for like three uh, years for Herbert Hoover, for sure. And then in comes him with his New Deal. Oh, by the way, uh, he borrowed that from uh, Theodore Roosevelt, too. Theodore Roosevelt had the square deal. And he he took that idea, tweaked it, and came out with the New Deal. So the New Deal was what was government intervening on a large scale to put people back to work. And this was not American. It just wasn't American. Are you having people? Wait a minute. You're having the government involved with hiring people? No, you can't do that. That's wrong. That's just wrong. The economy should be separate from the state. He says, no, we got to get people back to work. So he had people put back to work with the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, you, there's, there's bridges all over the place in this area that were built by the Civilian Conservation Corps. There were murals made, there were roads made, schools built, airports built from this program, from the state intervening in the economy. So it wasn't such a bad idea, although it never did get America all the way out of the Depression. America kind of remained in a well-employed depression all the way up until uh, the specter of war arose in the latter part of the 30s and the rise of Adolf Hitler, who, by the way, came into uh, uh, power the exact same year that uh, FDR did. And I think that's an important thing to remember that, um, I mean, I love the guy, but he's as close as we have come to a dictator. And I say that positively. Sometimes you need a dictator. You need someone to come in and say, we're going to do it this way. And that's, that was very atypical uh, for the, in the American circumstance. Presidents were pretty low-key, and he wasn't low-key. He was like saying, we're going to do this. 
Uh, so uh, he, and, and he was, in a sense, a dictator. But think about it, he was also a cripple. He, was, he had polio. He never did get over that. Uh, he was in, in a wheelchair or always walking along. He, he could never walk. He was always a cripple. But he was in, he was um, uh, nominated and inaugurated as president four times. That's unheard of. That's the only one time in American history that that's happened, and it happened with him. Why? Because of the unusual times that it took place in. Two of the terms were involved with the uh, happening of the, the Great Depression, trying to get people out of the Great Depression. And uh, he was the very voice and view of optimism and good humor. Uh, people loved him. There were people that were alive uh, when he died that had never known anyone else but him as a president, right? So you have to really, I have to honor this person for what he did for the American people to keep them out of um, go, kind of going communist. I mean, was, you know, there were riots in the streets going on. It was, uh, as he himself said to the capitalists, he says, don't those sons of bitches know I'm trying to save them? You know, because he was trying to save the system. So what has come to, what I have used him for, what I intend to use, what he gave me, was he, uh, the two big ones that are, are for us, b besides him adding to the national park system, doing a, 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 a whole bunch of stuff with, with our park system, and so many other things, what he did for me personally, selfishly, was unemployment insurance. I was thrown out of a job in California for no reason of my own. They just, uh, they changed some, uh, the, the Jarvis Gans Act passed, and that means that the counties couldn't tax anymore, and I was just thrown out of a job in, within one week. And if I didn't have that uh, unemployment, I would have been out. I would have been on the street or living with my parents. So what did I, I get? I got four or five months of unemployment so I could find another job, which I did in four months, right? And I was looking around for work. Do you see how valuable that is? And do you see also how it kept us from going into a recession with this whole housing debacle that happened in 2008? We would have been in a full-blown depression if it hadn't been for the things that, uh, uh, that FDR did. The other thing that he did, which may not think, you may not think it's that important, but he put in Social Security. That's your money. It's not like they're giving it to you out of some goodness of their heart. They don't have good hearts. Congress, do you expect a bunch of millionaires to really care about what your future is? You know, think about it a little bit. I mean, they would worry about you around election time, but, you know... Anyway, he uh, got Social Security through. Now, for me, that's around $1,300 a month. So I better have some other source of income or be prepared to move to Thailand or something uh, in order to live on, on $1,300 a month, right? That won't even pay for a two-bedroom apartment in Reno, will it? But it's something. It's not nothing. Then he did something that called TMCC into existence, and that's called the, um, oh, come on, the uh, GI Bill. All the GIs uh, could go to school. Well, geez, there weren't that many schools. So they had to build schools. They had, uh, you know, the, the only school in Nevada was UNR. That's it. And it was small. It was just the quadrangle. Look at it now. It's this monster over there, right? And a place like this is for people who uh, can't afford uh, go, to go to a fancy place like UNR or Yale or something. No, th uh, him giving uh, people four years worth of money to go to school, everyone who's in the military could go to school with that kind of money, caused places like TMCC to come into existence and caused the CSU system in California to come into existence with its like how 30 different branches and also the various branches of the UC system over there. I mean, California is laden with colleges, is it not? And I'm talking about the public ones. So that happened because of what? Because of stuff that he passed. And he convinced America to go to war with, against Adolf Hitler. He secretly backed Winston when the America did not want to go to war. He was sending destroyers over there going, oh yeah, I'm not doing that, sending them over, sending them over. And he was just uh, blowing smoke at the American people while supporting Winston Churchill. He had a back channel going really strong. And he was praying for something to happen. And ultimately what happened was he cut off the oil to Japan and Japan got 85 to 90% of its oil from America. And he cut it off in, in August or July 
and the clock was ticking. And so when was Pearl Harbor? He cut off the oil in August, say, of 1941. And the Japanese Army, uh, Navy said, what, what? We need oil to run a big ship. And so the clock's ticking. And what happens on December 6th, 1941, like four months later? Pearl Harbor. But Pearl Harbor wasn't the reason. The, the reasoning behind Pearl Harbor was that's where, where our fleet was. They wanted to knock out the fleet so they could attack the Dutch East Indies because that's where the oil was. That's where the shell oil was. Shell oil, you've heard of shell oil? Yeah, I don't know if they, if they call it that anymore. Is, is, is a Dutch company. And they drilled in Sumatra and Java, those areas. And there's a lot of oil there. And uh, the Japanese knew the oil was there, and they wanted that oil. So they what, what they did was they attacked Pearl Harbor, and then they attacked the Philippines. Caught MacArthur with his pants completely down around his ankles, by the way. Didn't, I mean, MacArthur didn't even get the planes off the airfields. He left them out there to be bombed. And then he, he goes, I shall return, and goes off to Australia to take over a hotel. And um, so the war begins. And then Hitler gives him a very nice present. Because, hey, we only have a war going on with Japan. Who does he really want to fight? He wants to back Winston Churchill's play in Europe. So Hitler does something that he didn't have to do and he shouldn't have done. He declared war on America. And you can just almost hear him at a distance. You can hear Roosevelt going, yes! Because now, and they declare war back, right back on him. And uh, that's where the, uh, the major focus of the war effort will be, is on uh, the uh, European uh, theater. That's, when you think of World War II, you think of island hopping and all that kind of, uh, there's some really nasty stuff over there, uh, particularly uh, Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal is a really nasty, uh, uh, read, read about Guadalcanal. The, 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 the Japanese themselves say, uh, what was the turning point in the war? Ask, uh, they asked the Japanese that, and they said one word, Guadalcanal. And after that, it was island hopping. But in Europe, what it was, was it was, uh, it was him providing the leadership and just saying, okay, everyone, shift to war. And so they had uh, like GM and Ford make, starting to make tanks. They didn't make any cars, except for cars to be used in, in war settings. They made Jeeps, things that we've come to think of as normative, uh, we made a lot of stuff during that period, but not very many cars because rubber was uh, in short supply. He was the leader through the Great Depression, and, and he took us all the way through this mighty war. And when he left, we were Godzilla of the planet. We handily won in two whole separate areas of the planet, Europe and Pacific, with a lot of help from our friends like Stalin and uh, what's, how many million, 60 million people died, 100 million? I mean, a lot of Russians died. Uh, the Russians took the brunt of World War II. We just kind of waltzed in later on and you know, uh, took Western Europe. But um, we came into our own and made the 20th century our century. Now, the 21st century is still a, a, a project in works. We, we, we see our president, president, for good or ill, I, I am not equipped to uh, say, is pulling in his horns a little bit. China's right there, ready to step in, right? Russia's messing with us, with uh, cyber hacking and stuff, right? Things are getting a little wavery, aren't they, in this 21st century we're, we're well into. But the 20th century, especially the last over half of it, was ours. I think you find that first waiver in 2001 when those planes hit those towers. That's the first, <laughs> you know, God, uh, Godzilla gets hit with a double whammy or a triple whammy there. Um, I have four minutes left. And I will conclude by talking about, just briefly, uh, and I, I, I'm not doing her justice because she was all over the place, is Eleanor Roosevelt. She was the legs and eyes of FDR. FDR couldn't go anywhere. He had to go... Uh, sneak around. He had to be put into a car. No one could know that he did, his legs didn't work. It was the best kept secret for 10 years. No one knew that he couldn't walk. There are no pictures. People would take pictures of him in a wheelchair and other photographers would rip the camera apart and take away the film. So there was a conspiracy to say he can walk. So 
Eleanor Roosevelt, a Roosevelt in her own right, was his uh, eyes and his legs. She went all over the place inspecting things. And we can, uh, it was FDR's greatest hope that they would resuscitate what had been called the League of Nations and make the United Nations happen. That was a very idealistic move. You can agree with it or disagree. I mean, there's been a whole cycle of conspiracy theories involving the UN, which I just don't buy. But the UN is a world court where you can take your grievances to it and work them out. And they've been, uh, also have worked on saving uh, cultural sites all over the world, saving lives. The UN, and by the way, where is the UN located? Is it in Geneva? Is it in The Hague? Is it in Brazil? Where is it? It's an ugly looking building right along where? First Avenue. New York, right next to the First Avenue. First Avenue. Yeah. First Avenue yeah, so whose pocket is it in? I ask you that. It's in our pocket. Right? They have to come over to New York. That's, the, that's our economic center to do anything at the UN. Is, is that impressive? Does that give us something? Yeah. What will happen also that was in the, in, in the makings uh, when uh, Roosevelt was alive is NATO, the North Atlantic. That had a lot more meaning then because that's where the North Atlantic War, all those destroyers and all those submarines and all those ships drinking uh, salt water going down. That all happened in the North Atlantic. And that's why it's called NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And then, of course, you know, they would uh, back that. There would be the Warsaw Pact. Finally, it's probably something that he would have done. Truman did it. Uh, is, but it, it, it has FDR's fingerprints all over it, is the Marshall Plan. All these people worked with FDR, and it's something that he would have done. He rebuilt, they rebuilt Europe. And it's something that... Uh, I think that uh, Eleanor and um, FDR would have been uh, uh, completely behind. So, but she is, the last thing we see her doing is uh, creating in her husband's image the UN. She is the one that did it. Because, wh for why? Because FDR is dead. Truman asked her to do it. And she said, I don't, th I don't want to. And he said, would you please? And she did, and it wouldn't have happened without her. So this is uh, Declaration of Human Rights. Yeah, the Declaration of Human Rights we, that you should have, uh, have have work, be treated with dignity. I mean, yeah. No, thank you for reminding that. That's that, that's a document that's that, that should be up there with uh, the Gettysburg Address or the Magna Carta. I don't know some big pieces of paper. Those are pieces of paper that say oh, the whole world should be treated well. We've fallen away from that substantially since that very idealistic time. Directly after wars, everyone's going, we've got to not do that again. Well, it's been 60 years. We'll see something coming. I hope I'm dead uh, before it comes. But I would predict the latter part of the 21st century is going to get kind of hairy. The, there, the water table in the Middle East is going to get really low, for example, and many other things. Many people have nukes. So is the oil table. Pardon me? So is the oil table. Yes, the oil. Uh, no, you're, you're going to see stuff that I'm not going to see, that I don't, in fact, want to see, uh, possibly. Or maybe we'll all be peaceful. Yeah. Uh, I, I, if, if I had a laugh track, I'd have it played right then. Maybe it'll all be nice, laugh track, like a Milton Berle laugh track. <laughs>